Good morning. My name is Steve Lammers. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, if you've been following along in our series on the book of of 1 Peter, um, you know that one of the major themes in the book is this this idea of submission. Whether it's submission to God as the ultimate authority or uh, submission to uh, government leaders or to husbands or bosses or even to to church leaders. The idea is that everyone has someone to submit to. And uh, I've been following along a little bit in, uh, with, a, with a podcast by Christianity Today about a, a, a church leader who a number of years ago fell from his position. And there are a lot of takeaways from that. But one of, one of the ones I took away was that the reason for his fall wasn't necessarily, at least at first, some sort of um, obvious just, um, quote, big sin in his life. It was this. I am the boss. Uh, I am not going to allow anyone to um, speak into my life and care for me and shepherd me. Uh, I'm not going to submit. Submission is for other people, not me. And and looking back on that, a, a lot earlier, it should have been a red flag for us. And, um, and I don't even know if you know the situation. We don't need to share the situation. The, the, the point is, as we look at our own lives, and as I look at my life, and, and I think about um, how we tend to see submission and see authority, whew, it ought to be a, a big red flag. And so my prayer this morning is that we would look at submission, we would look at authority, not as like these dirty words to avoid, but as Uh, the expression of the love of God, our chief shepherd, who in in his love, in his mercy, he gives us under shepherds called elders. So let me pray uh, before we look more closely at this text. Father, even as we want you to speak to us this morning, we are aware of uh, just so many obstacles to hearing you, to really hearing you. And, Lord, it could be that there are men and women here or young people here who have been wrongly treated by a church or its leadership. Uh, Maybe even our church and our leadership. We we don't know. Um, And that can be a huge obstacle to to hearing this word. Uh, Or it may be, Father, that it's simply the obstacles of our own hearts, that we just don't want to listen to any authority. I know that is so often, way too often, the case in my own life, and in particular uh, lives here. And so, Lord, forgive us for that. And uh, whatever the obstacles are that get in the way of us hearing you, would you remove them now? Uh, Would you enable us to, to wherever the words that I say align with your word, uh, enable us to hear them, enable us to, to have our hearts softened, and to be able to rejoice in you for what you've given us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was at a, a pastor's conference a number of years ago. Uh, it was in Colorado. It was, this, uh, it, was, it was sort of a really informal type of conference. Most of us knew each other and uh, really just loved and respected each other. So we'd go on hikes together and that sort of thing. It was just all this, these opportunities to, to share together and pray together and uh, uh, a lot of times, mostly share the mistakes we've made, and one of the one of the opportunities that that really stuck out to me was this group. Uh, it was an even smaller group that got aside. I mean, it was like ten of us, and we're kind of sharing back and forth. And there was this older pastor there, and um, we just all respected him so much. And what stuck out is just the humility in which he was sharing the mistakes he made. So we were asking him about it, and and he said, "Well, I'll tell you, you know." I've been in ministry for about 30 years, and uh, one of the things I'm finally just now starting to learn is, is to, to be a little quicker and a little bolder to show people uh, the issues in their, to help them see the issues in their own lives. Because he said, you know, one, one way that you learn that, that people are really struggling spiritually it's not so much that when they have, you know, some weird belief in their lives, so that's a problem. Uh, it's not so much 
that they've got some wrong practice in their lives. It is when, if someone in their small group or someone in church leadership goes to them and confronts them about those things, if they're unwilling to receive correction, you know there's trouble coming. And he said, you know, at, at that point, when, when, when that becomes clear, he says, it didn't really matter in my 30 experiences how much they were serving in church, uh, how, you know, how committed they were to the, the children's ministry or the youth ministry or uh, the, the, you know, evangelism and missions and, you know, Bible studies and church programs. He said, he said, if there is not some sense that when they are corrected, there's not some sense of, yes, thank you, God, that you've given me leaders, that you have given me people who can speak into my life and, and, and shepherd me and correct me. If, if there is not some sense of that, even in, in seed form, then you can be assured that at some point when trouble comes, it is not going to end well for them in their relationship with God. And I'll tell you, I don't have 30 years of ministry experience. Uh, I've got about 20. And um, I'd say that just really rings true to me. And so what I want to do this morning is, is look at uh, w- what we see here is that, that one of the ways in which God loves us is that he, you know, as our chief shepherd, he gives us under shepherds uh, to care for us. He gives us uh, elders. And so we're going to look at two things about elders here. We're going to look at the plurality of elders and the oversight of elders. Plurality and oversight. All right, first, plurality. And I know that's a weird word. (laughs) I tried to look up synonym for plurality, uh, like multiplicity. There's just not a really good uh, synonym for, for plurality, so... It's just plurality. Add, add that to your everyday vocab, right? Um, so, weird word. What do I mean by that? Uh, look, look at verse 1. I exhort the elders, plural, among you. Uh, verse 3. Uh, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples, plural, to the flock, singular. One flock, plural, elders. Then verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger... Be subject to the elders. Now, why is that important? I'll give you just a couple examples from Scripture. Uh, One is uh, in the book of Acts with the Apostle Paul and and Barnabas. Uh, They would go and they would would be missionaries to various places. And uh, it was their regular habit that when they went to to do their missions work, they would do something that I think is actually a, a good bit different from how Western missionaries have often done it. They would, they would go to a place, and they would, they would preach the gospel, uh, and instead of, like what, what we sometimes do, instead of staying there for 20, 30, 40 years as foreigners and not giving up the leadership to uh, local people, they would pretty quickly preach the gospel and then move on. But how, preach the gospel and, and be in relationship, and but how did they know when to move on? Acts chapter 14, verse 23. When they had appointed elders, plural. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, that then they committed them to the Lord. In other words, it wasn't just when people became Christians. Though obviously, that is extremely important. But that's just the first step. It was when God raised up elders from among those Christians. That's when the Apostle Paul and Barnabas said, okay, now we have a church. It's time to move on. Uh, Another example uh, from Titus chapter 1. Paul says to Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order. Okay, so there's this uh, this loose-knit group of Christians, and Paul says, I want you to put what remained in order. Uh, how was Titus to put what remained in order? What would that mean? He says, Paul says, appoint, what do you think? Elders. <laughs> appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Okay, let me, let me, let me put it maybe a different way. 
Um, when is it that a small group Bible study or any Bible study becomes a church? Is it when, you know, it gets a little bigger and you start singing and praying or, um, you know, uh, doing better evangelism or something? Is that it? Um, is it when some sort of very charismatic leader says, all right, it's time. Uh, and you know what? Since I started this church, you're going to follow me, and I'm going to be kind of the guy, and we're going to just, we're going to take it. No, it is when God raises up elders to shepherd that flock. And they receive the laying on of hands. Multiple elders. And, you know, this is really important even when a church gets to be our size and we have multiple elders. It's really important for us to, to continue to remember that, that the authority in, the, in a church does not rest in, you know, Steve Lammers. Uh, I like to say Steve the Lesser. Uh, it, it, uh, it also doesn't reside in Steve the Greater, Right? Uh, it doesn't reside in, in Mike Roop, uh, Ken Kurzel. I'm just looking around, uh, Jay Lynch, I could mention others, uh, godly men, we're glad they're here, right? But, but the authority for a church resides as we dwell in community as elders. And by the way, you know, this is one of the reasons, I mean, even as I just see Mike get up here and I see Steve, and I, this is one of the reasons I love um, the leadership of this church. I love this idea that we have a, a shared preaching responsibility. And it's not, you know, it's not like that's the only way to do it. There, you know, you, certainly you can have a lead pastor who preaches the vast majority of the time. That, that, that's fine. But, but for us, one of the ways that we're trying to express this, this sort of plurality of elders, um, one of the ways, actually, frankly, we're trying to hold each other accountable is is by saying, hey, you know, we're, we're going to share the preaching so that there isn't like one super pastor who's going to be the guy. All right, so that, that's the importance of, of the plurality of elders. Uh, what about the oversight of elders? In other words, what's, what's the job description of elders? Uh, Peter says it in verse 1 and, you know, sort of on at the end of, or at the beginning of verse 2. He says, I exhort the elders among you uh, to eventually what? Shepherd the flock of God. Shepherd the flock of God. So, so what does it mean to, to shepherd uh, or to, to be an overseer? Uh, at least a couple things. First one is authority. Now, we've already sort of mentioned that, and, and we need to unpack that a little bit because uh, there's just all sorts of misunderstandings of authority, right? Um, and, and, you know, we need to say that, that all authority uh, from sinful human beings, with sinful human beings, all, all authority is derivative. In other words, it's not like we just show up and say, okay, you know, we're, we're in charge now. We have this, like, right to, to rule inherently and in, in because of who we are. No, our authority derives from God's authority. And the more that uh, we are like him, the more it validates our authority. The more we are unlike him, the more it invalidates our authority. And that's important. We see that in multiple places. But, but look again at verse 2. Peter says to the elders, shepherd the flock of God. God's flock, okay? So shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Okay, there's a lot there we could unpack, but the main thing I want us to see is the, it's what? It's the flock of God. It's not the flock of the elders. It's the flock of God, his church. And, you know, I, uh, I thought about this a lot when I was the lead pastor at Faith Church. Because oftentimes what would happen is, you know, I'd be out sort of getting to know people. I'd be at the soccer field watching my girls play, or um, I'd, I'd be following up somebody who had visited the church. And, and a lot of times they would say things like, hey, you know, I, I really like your church. 
or as I'm getting to know somebody, hey, tell us about your church. And, um, you know, I, I never corrected people because, I mean, I use that language. It's just sort of everyday language, right? Um, we use the phrases, your church, my church, those sorts of things. And yet every time I heard it, it was just a little bit unnerving because the language you use oftentimes sort of trickles down into our heart uh, understanding of it. And if we move into this idea that somehow this is a particular pastor's church, is my church, we we run into dangerous territory because it is the church of Jesus. It's Jesus' flock. And then look look at verse 4. Jesus is referred to as the chief shepherd. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And again, uh, we, we can't get into all of that. Praise God, elders among you. Uh, there is uh, an unfading crown of glory awaiting you, right? Not because you've earned it, because he crowns his own uh, works in you and through you. Um, <laughs> praise God. But the, but the thing I want us to see is that Jesus is called the chief shepherd. Now, this is huge because... Because where is it that Peter got this idea that Jesus is the chief shepherd? Uh, Remember, Peter was there when Jesus in John chapter 10 was describing himself. And he was saying, you know, there's some shepherds that when the wolves come, they scatter. Uh, And by the way, he he later describes how, you know, not everybody who um, is claiming to be a sheep is actually a sheep. Some are wolves. But he says, you know, some shepherds, when the, when the wolves come, they, they scatter. Not so with me. He says, I am the good shepherd. And what's the ultimate expression of how he exercises his role as the good shepherd? He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And then, then he says something really fascinating. In the context of that, that passage, he says, actually, I have authority to do that. No one takes my life from me. I do it of my own accord. So, so there it's Jesus uh, as the ultimate authority, as a chief shepherd. And he's saying, what do I do Is that? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The shepherd lays down his life to pay the penalty uh, for what we deserve as his sheep. And let me just say, I, you know, before we even go any further, lest this be, be unsaid, um, like I mentioned, Jesus makes it clear that not everyone uh, is sheep, that, that we don't just show up in church as a sheep simply because we're here. Uh, we don't show up in this world as sheep. We show up in this world as wolves. We are born dead in our sins. We are born uh, as wolves. And it is a merciful God who has to come and lay down his life for his sheep and, and take those, those wolvish hearts of ours and, and, and rip them out and, and give us new hearts and change us and, and and draw us to himself so that we would, as sheep, follow the good shepherd. And I would just say this morning, if, if you don't know if you're a sheep, really, what I don't, the main thing I want you to get here this morning, uh, I think the text would, would want you to get, is not so much the, the intricacies of uh, how elders are to relate to church and, and that sort of thing, but if you're not Sure, if you're a sheep, I would just encourage you to to point you to verse 5, where God says, He opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So if you're not sure where you're at this morning, I would just say, if you would humble yourself before the Lord and say, Lord, I I don't think I'm a sheep. I, I I think I'm a wolf. And I think maybe the reason that I find Christianity so distasteful 
or the reason I'm here and I, I kind of yawn at sermons or, you know, singing, just, ah. Um, the reason I'm so off-put by this is that, is that actually I'm here as a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And Lord, I, and I'm, and I'm fighting against you and I, I need you, Lord Jesus, to change my heart, to grant me faith and to grant me repentance. Lord, would you, would you do that? Okay, listen. Um, that's humility. And, and the text makes it clear that if you can come to him like that, God gives grace to the humble. He, he gives grace to those who would simply admit their sin, admit, oh, I, I desperately need a Savior because my sin is ugly and I deserve hell, and I, I need your grace. I need your undeserved favor. Um, if, you haven't, if you haven't come to him like that, I, I hope you will. I pray that you will. But then let's, let's get back to the passage. In verse 2, we, we learn that the elders are to exercise oversight, and um, you know, that, um, that oversight, that, right, that authority Jesus already had, had shown, that, that authority is the authority to to give our lives uh, for the sheep. But we also need to realize that authority is real authority, right? It's not pretend authority. It's not like this theoretical authority where we can go, ah, you know, the elders, that's, that's one opinion. They're kind of dumb. I'll, I'll just kind of do my own thing. No, it, it's, it's, actually, it's actually real authority. Um, so just look, look, at, look at some of these verses again. Verse 2, um, elders are to exercise oversight. That word oversight or overseers could be translated as a synonym um, supervisors, people who are in charge. Verse 3 um, says that explicitly, not domineering over those in your charge. Now there's two sides of that, right? Not domineering, but these sheep actually are in your charge. Uh, verse 5, you who are younger, be subject to uh, or submit to these elders. Uh, all of you, it says, uh, need to, to have this attitude. Right? Of, right? Non-elders submitting to elders. Okay, so that's, that's one important aspect of, of eldership. Um, it's genuine authority. But another aspect is care. Just, just genuine care, not care for the sake of, of getting a paycheck, which all pastors are, are, are tempted toward. Not, not care to make ourselves look good, um, but just willing, tender, uh, genuine care. Uh, and we see this throughout the text, but what really caught my eye was in verse 1. Peter says just, just this incredible thing at the beginning. He says, uh, I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder. <laughs> the reason I think this is so amazing, this is coming from the apostle Peter. Like, he's a big deal. And he, he comes along and he says, yeah, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm just a fellow elder, fellow shepherd with you, walking alongside you. Where did Peter learn that kind of humility? Where did he learn that he's, he's a shepherd? You may remember the scene, right? Um, after Peter denied Jesus, and it was ugly. It was big-time sin, right? And the, the rooster crows three times. Uh, Jesus is, is raised from the dead, and he appears to Peter, and he reinstates Peter. How did he reinstate him? He came to, me, he came to him three times and said, Peter, you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? I do, Lord. Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. See, Eldership certainly implies authority. It, it, it carries authority. 
but it's just this, this tender care, right? It, it's feeding people God's Word. Jesus says it's, it's tending to sheep, right? Attending implies all sorts of things. It implies um, walking alongside, uh, listening, um, seeing where people are, are really at, uh, under, understanding them so that, so that you can uh, apply the gospel in the appropriate ways. Right? That's, you know, and, you know, of course, rebuking sheep when they're uh, straying from what God's Word says. That's the, the kind of, of care and authority that, that elders are supposed to have. So here, here's the question now. How do we apply that if you're a non-elder? Right, because there's, you know, not, like, should I just preach to elders? You know, there's like seven of us. Um, how do you apply it in, in specific ways if you're uh, not an elder in this church? And I would just... I just ask this question, and I ask it in love. But, but are you willing to allow anyone into your life in an official capacity to shepherd you in that way, to speak into your life? And, and I love that this uh, comes up <laughs> even as we're having a welcome to the family event. Uh, a, a sort of a church family, church membership event. And, and listen, we didn't plan this. I, I, we like the elders didn't get in a back room and go, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna manipulate people into joining the church." We don't we don't want to manipulate. We couldn't manipulate you even if we wanted to. And yet, I I, I love that, that that it's happening now because this is church membership is such a beautiful opportunity, a beautiful expression of, of what Peter is talking about here. And the reason I think that is, I think, you know, you can correct me later if I'm wrong, but I, I think this is probably true of most of us, that when we think of the word church, uh, particularly as, as Protestant, non, non-Catholic, evangelical, if we want to use that word, uh, when we think of the word church, our minds tend to, I think, go toward the worldwide church, the, the invisible sort of spiritual amorphous church. And, and, and that's a thing, right? That's, that's a good thing. And yet, I don't think that's what Peter is talking about here. Peter is talking about particular local churches. And he's talking about particular people submitting to and, and being willing to, to undergo the, the oversight of particular elders in, in those, those local churches. And so I want us to think of it this way. Imagine... Uh, a boyfriend and girlfriend. And this boyfriend and girlfriend say, you know, hey, we, we really believe in marriage. We, but, you know, this global big picture of marriage, oh yeah, that we're on board. We are pro-marriage. And so you say, oh, well, then you must be thinking you're going to get married. And they go, whoa, we didn't say that. Right? We, we want to keep our options open here. We, we like the idea of marriage, but we don't like the idea of marrying each other. Would you say those people are actually pro-marriage? Or are they just kind of saying they're pro-marriage in theory? In the same way, if, if we were, were to say, you know what, I, I, I believe in the church. Right? I am pro-God's global, uh, invisible church. And, and you, you come up and say, oh, well, so then you, you, you must be planning on joining one of those expressions of God's uh, invisible church. You must be going to a uh, visible church and submitting to them. And they go, oh, no, no, no. We want to keep our options open and not get that committed. Would you say that person actually does believe in, in God's church? So we have to, you know, I mean, so the question again is, is are you willing to, to marry the church, so to speak, rather than date the church? Or, or to ask it that same way, um, is there really anyone that you are giving official permission to shepherd you, to care for you, to correct you when needed? Because here's the thing, and I've seen it big time in my own life. It is usually the case that when we most need shepherding, <laughs> that's when we're least likely to ask for it. 
or want it. Uh, I was thinking about this even just this past Wednesday. That this, this is just so true in my life. Uh, I was having a rough day. Uh, I was having a rough like several days or week. I was just getting frustrated with things, and I was, I was cranky. Um, to, that's kind of to put it nicely. Uh, ask my family. I mean, I was I was like snapping at them for little things. Um, there was no gratitude in my life. I think it expressed it maybe even in uh, in staff meetings or conversations that I had. I was just down and. And I was kind of being a jerk, okay? And um, so, but there we are. We're, we're in staff meeting on Wednesday. And uh, Steve, I didn't talk about this, but I'm going to share. I'm going to share a story. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, he does that a lot. I, you know, fair game. Um, uh, so we're, um, we're, we're in staff meeting, and Steve's uh, asking uh, for prayer requests, as we, we almost always do. And uh, it, Others had asked, and others had asked for prayers, and, and so it came around to me and said, Steve, you know, what do you want to pray for? And I, I don't remember what I said, some, something really shallow, I'm sure. Uh, and so we, you know, and then we went on to somebody else, and, and somehow he circled back around to me. And I don't know if he did it on purpose, I don't know if you saw something odd in me or something was just a little off, uh, but he said, you know, Steve, is there anything else that you want to pray for? And there was a part of me that said, yeah, back off, you know? Um, but he was just being a good pastor. So he's probing a little bit. And, and I said, you know, actually, there is something. And uh, I need God to grant me repentance. I need to turn to Jesus in this because it is not good. And, um, and actually, later, someone in my one another group asked for prayer requests. I'm like, crap! <laughs> uh, and uh, so I shared something similar. Now, I, I share that not to say, oh, you know, look how awesome I am for, for confessing my sin or whatever. I, I share that to say, we all need this. We all need this. So again, if, is, there, is there anyone in your life that you're giving official permission, not theoretical permission, official permission where you're saying, I'm submitting to your authority. I'm, I'm giving up uh, the authority to make my own decisions and sort of dig in my heels. So when you do that, 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 that's part of what church membership is. And so I would just say, if there is something in you that is keeping you from allowing that kind of authority in your life, I want to go back to verse 5. God opposes the proud, and that's pride. That, that is me saying, I'm not going to let anybody shepherd me. I will shepherd me. Or, or better yet, maybe more self-deceiving, Jesus will shepherd me. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Jesus is going to shepherd me, and, you know, the way I'm going to express that is I'm going to ignore all his under-shepherds. It doesn't work that way. God opposes the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to those who would say, Jesus, I need you. I need you as the chief shepherd and overseer of my soul. I need you as, as the one who lays down his life for your sheep. And, and I need the under-shepherds that you've given me. So let's pray that, that that would be our heart response before we take the Lord's Supper. Lord, uh, as we're about to uh, take communion this morning, we are reminded that um, it is a picture of your shepherding care for us, that, that you as your shepherd, as our shepherd, do lay down your life for your sheep, that you gave your your body and your blood to all who would humble themselves and come before you saying, I need you. I have deep sin, so I desperately need you. And I need the under-shepherds you've provided to help me see that. So as we partake of this bread and wine representing your body and your blood, we, we pray that you would use it to further humble us, 
that you would show us areas maybe where we're, we're holding back. Uh, show us maybe how, how deep our sin goes. But not, Lord, so that we would wallow in it, not so that we would um, beat ourselves up, but so that we would be able to come and, and take these elements rejoicing that you forgive the worst of us and, and the deepest sin that's in us uh, by your blood. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.